So the next speaker um, is Frederick Stromberg, is the um, co-founder of Mulvad. Frederick established his first connection with the internet in the mid-1990s and has been fascinated by networks, open source software, and security ever since. In 2009, together with Daniel Bernstein, he co-founded Mulvad, a privacy-focused VPN service. And today he will talk about some reflections on operating this service. So please welcome him to the stage. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Half a century ago, a man named Manfred Kleins coined the word cyborg to describe humans that in some way have merged with their machines. Klein saw the marriage between organism and technology as a means of expanding human experience by taking care of specific problems automatically and unconsciously, just as our hearts beat without conscious control. Many life forms use tools as a modification of the physical self to extend its abilities. It's certainly not a new concept for us. What makes the information age different is that instead of extending our physical abilities, we are using intelligent machines to extend our mental selves. We have all experienced the side effects. For example, we are losing our ability to concentrate. The role of facts is diminishing due to our susceptibility to manipulation and cognitive biases. And we are losing our ability to tolerate boredom. The current interface between us and our intelligent machines is pretty one-sided. Our eyes and ears can receive and interpret a lot of information quickly. But our feedback is only about 10 to 50 bits per second as we type with our hands. I invite you to imagine a future five, 10 years from now when we have better interfaces. Imagine what machine learning will do with twice or 10 times the bandwidth. To quote Elon Musk, it's mostly about the bandwidth, particularly your output. This technology could be used to serve you, help you do more meaningful things with your time, together with people you love, even make the world a better place. But unfortunately, maybe that's not the trajectory we're heading on. There's a downside, of course. Uh, I think you've all know Harari, the historian who wrote Sapiens, Homo Deus, and now 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. Uh, I highly recommend the, the third book, or at least read a, an article summarizing it. It's quite uh, thought-provoking. He says, the algorithms are watching you, and once they know you better than you know yourself, they could control and manipulate you. Unfortunately, Based on the current behavior of a lot of companies and governments, we should expect increasing abuse. I'm sure most of you have experienced the addictive appeal of mobile apps, for instance. No wonder trust in tech companies is eroding. <clears throat> and trustworthiness is important. The services we provide require our users to trust us. They should feel confident in expecting us to fulfill our obligation well, to our, fulfill our commitment toward them, now and in the future. This is also the reason why security should be deeply ingrained in the tech company's culture. Security is how we gain trust in our systems, so that we may earn it from our users in turn. Ultimately, I think this philosophy calls upon us to build solutions that rely less on trust of human character, and more on technology and mathematics. Which brings me to the idea of transparency. People in power should be held to a higher standard than the rest of us, because in, with power comes the ability to acquire more, as well as conceal it. We expect transparency and accountability from our leaders. The more power, the more accountability. Shouldn't we require the same from the hardware and software we use? Especially as that hardware and software 
is increasingly effectively becoming extensions of our minds. Which brings me to the technological foundations upon which we build. They are not particularly trustworthy, nor are they transparent. Most of you probably know this, but it deserves mentioning again because of how insane it is. When your Intel or AMD CPU starts, it is bootstrapped with firmware on an SPI flash memory. Some of this firmware is encrypted, and Intel won't release the source code. If you start an Intel computer without this encrypted blob, it will run for 30 minutes and then turn off. The computer clearly works without this encrypted blob, but Intel won't let you run your computer without this encrypted blob. The SPI flash is one example of where attackers can persist their backdoors even after you reformat or replace the hard drive. There are others. It is highly unfortunate that it is so hard to get back to a known good state. I could have an even, well, I could talk a long time about the BMC and the IPMI and all that technology uh, that you house in your data centers, but uh, I'll let current articles speak for themselves. Complexity isn't only an issue in hardware, of course. Another problem is software configuration complexity. Here's an example. Here's a concrete example from my industry. Uh, last year, there, were, there was approximately 550,000 OpenVPN servers running on the default port. Heartbleed was four years ago. <clears throat> and uh, in case you don't recall, Heartbleed was a vulnerability in OpenSSL that enabled the attacker to extract some of the memory from uh, web servers in particular, uh, although this affected other services that use OpenSSL open as well. It was used initially to extract cookie information, uh, session IDs and stuff, and then it was hypothesized that you could use it to extract private key information, bits from your SSL certificate. We uh, thought about this and we thought we could do the same thing with OpenVPN, and we did. We managed to extract one of the primes out of memory. OpenVPN multiplexes uh, TLS inside its own wrapping protocol. It multiplexes a TLS connection with an IP tunnel. And so we managed to exploit Heartbleed within OpenVPN, extracting one of the primes, and using one of the primes and the modulus, which is public, we managed to recreate the other prime. So it, clearly, these certificates should have been uh, revoked and uh, regenerated, but they weren't. If VPN authentication was simpler, if TLS configuration was simpler, perhaps this wouldn't be the case. I should probably mention that one of these certificates was actually shared with uh, 7,000 servers. Fun fact. Now, moving on to software in general. <clears throat> My point with this slide is roughly uh, the security in depth is not very good. If you own the web browser, you own the machine. Once you can execute code, the attack surface is so large that a lot of it is considered game over. Firefox deserves a shout out for trustworthiness uh, on this slide, and I will tell you why. Uh, so let's look at technology that I believe is more worthy of our trust. <clears throat> These are great examples of technology that embody what I'm trying to convey. Above all, they facilitate trust in various ways. Rust, the R, is a systems programming language. Its performance is on par with C++, and yet it is memory safe, and it doesn't need a garbage collector. We can use it to make kernels, we can use it to make network stacks, we can use it to make browsers, you can use it in embedded controllers, even real-time real systems as opposed to, well, I'm, I'm hoping that increasingly we will replace C and C++ with Rust, where security is 
critical of critical importance. Uh, we use Rust. We built a desktop application in it. Uh, it works pretty well. There's an audit out. You can read it. In any case, uh, the Q stands for Cubes. Cubes is a security-oriented operating system. It uses the hypervisor Xen at the bottom. And now my screen died. There we go. It uses Xen at the bottom. And then it compartmentalizes your digital life into uh, VMs. So in the default installation, you have, for instance, your uh, network, your uh, Wi-Fi card. Uh, it needs some firmware. It needs drivers. It needs, uh, well, you need a DSCP client if you're connected to the network here, for instance. So what you do is you uh, assign your network, your uh, network card uh, with the drivers and the DSCP client to a VM, and your VM might even be disposable. It might regenerate every time you start the the computer. Uh, and then, connected to this VM, you could have another VM running your VPN client. And connected to this one, you have a VM for your browser, for your private stuff, for your work stuff, for your SSH, sysadmin VM, or whatever. And suddenly, if someone exploits the drivers using for the drivers for your network card or the DHCP client, they're not also getting into the environment where you have your SSH keys. This is what all of our sysadmins use. And I think that uh, the founder, the, the team behind Cubes, and in particular the founder, Joanna Rutkowska, she has some really good ideas on what would make uh, good operating systems. So I highly recommend you to take a look at her blog. There are two papers in particular. One is called X86 Considered Harmful. The other one is called State Considered Harmful. And she paints a pretty beautiful vision of what personal computers could be. In particular, with the future that I have painted in previous slides. WireGuard <coughs> is a modern VPN technology. It is extremely simple. It's fast. It's using state-of-the-art cryptography. It's opinionated. It doesn't allow you to choose the cryptographic suites which means it's a whole lot co less complex than TLS. Its kernel module is written in 4,000 lines of code. IPsec, in contrast, is 400,000 lines of code. You can even implement WireGuard without dynamic memory allocation. So it has a very strong security story. And for those interested in performance, I think you'll find that uh, not only is the performance uh, comparable to IPsec, it would also be possible to implement this in FPGAs or chips uh, in a, well, without too much work. So, and one feature in particular that I would like to highlight in WireGuard is its ability to optionally mix in a pre-shared key in its key derivation function. Um, so, there is a uh, you've all heard about uh, quantum computers, of course. Uh, we don't know when we'll get large enough quantum computers to crack some of the cryptographic primitives underlying uh, our security protocols today. I spoke with a researcher in Toronto who, whose research field is this exact subject. When will we have quantum computers that are powerful enough? And... Uh, if I recall correctly, he put, it, he put the risk in excess of 10% that before 2030, we will have those kinds of computers. And I asked him, what has changed uh, recently? And he said, he told me that he kept, they kept revising the number downwards. And I asked him, what has changed in the last five, five years? And he said, well, three years ago, researchers would have to hound funders, potential funders for grants, and today, there are multiple organizations spending in excess of a billion dollars each on building uh, quantum computers. Uh, so that's quite fascinating. But how does this relate to WireGuard? Well, the ability to mix in a pre-shared key 
uh, means that in a world where Diffie-Hellman and elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, the cryptographic algorithms underlying perfect forward secrecy in IPsec, in TLS, and in all the other protocols, <clears throat> it would be really nice if a quantum computer wouldn't be able to retroactively decrypt all of the traffic uh, that the attacker has recorded. So all the TLS traffic today, for instance, or and IPsec traffic that's being recorded uh, and saved in Utah, perhaps, or somewhere else, it will be able, <laughs> it will be retroactively decryptable once there is a, a quantum computer powerful enough. Perfect forward secrecy won't work because Diffie-Hellman and elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman will be retroactively breakable. So using a pre-shared key that you perhaps have uh, walked over to your friend and given to him or her, then suddenly your traffic would be post-quantum uh, confidential. Or you could use one of the uh, post-quantum secure uh, key exchange uh, algorithms. Uh, Diffie-Hellman and the curve Diffie-Hellman, they're not post-quantum secure, but there are those who are. And they are, well, they are becoming, uh, the first standardization conference for those was actually this year, in April, or maybe May. In any case, uh, WireGuard, as far as I'm concerned, is uh, the future of VPN technology. So if you use VPNs, I highly recommend you to take a look at it. If you have sysadmins, I highly re recommend you to take a look at cubes. And if you're writing things in C or C++, I would highly recommend you to take a look at Rust. Oops. <coughs> so, how does this relate to you as ISPs? Well, you operate the digital, global digital nervous system over which our ideas and most intimate communications flow. You are the guardians of our metadata, an asset, asset which has only increased in value. I hope that my perspective on trustworthiness and the future of privacy has given you some food for thought. A thought I had the other day, and I spoke to some of my ISP friends, is that, well, it seems to me this is not my area of expertise, but it seems to me uh, that the more direct peering you do, the more uh, privacy friendly the internet becomes, because it means fewer points, fewer hops where someone can intercept the traffic. It means a more distributed internet where an attacker would have to own more systems to be able to survey the same amount of traffic. That's just an idea. <clears throat> As technology becomes an ever larger part of our mental self, the potential for abuse and manipulation will only grow. Privacy relies on the trustworthiness of our digital systems, and trust is facilitated by security. Let's do what we can to make our technology foundations as sound as possible. Let's make sure that those foundations serve us as users and no one else. I'm quite optimistic about the future. The potential for improvement is immense. The greatest ideas and insights lie ahead of us. Thank you. We have some time for questions. Are there any questions, comments, reactions for Frederick? Okay, well, please join me in thanking him for a very thought-provoking presentation. Thank you, Frederick.